How's it going? Good morning. I'm Josh Heller. Logan Chapel here. Coming to you from J.R. Heller. And uh, we're going to have a great episode today. We're going to talk about the collapse of the uh, bank that just went down in Silicon Valley. All that Silicon Valley money. Crazy, man. Crazy. Uh, Josh, I mean, your your realm's the financial world. Uh, why don't you dive in, talk a little bit about what's going on? Because quite frankly, I need to learn from you and learn from others. I've been trying to take in as much info as I can to see kind of how it's going to play into the real estate market and how it's going to affect me. Yep. But tell me what you know and I'll, I'll kind of go off from there. Yeah. So, you know, obviously it's been in the news everywhere that the um, Silicon Valley Bank has basically gone under and now the government has control and, uh, you know, the FDIC is in it, making sure that everybody gets their money back, um, which I, I kind of want to touch on the whole FDIC thing and, and that whole thing too. Um, but yeah, the government has taken control of the bank. They're making sure that they let everybody know that you're going to get your money back and you don't have to run to your banks, your banks and pull out all your cash. I was going to say, cause I, I've been hearing a lot of people trying to do that. Yeah. They, they've been having issues. They haven't been able to access their farms. Yeah. I mean, dude, if, I can't imagine going to the bank and not be able to get on one. So let's, let's talk about, um, I think we, we need to step back and, and look at like fractional reserve banking and how the banking system actually works and how money actually works to understand, uh, interest rates, understand what happened with the bank and how that whole system works. Right. Yeah. So like, when you put money in a bank account, let's go, let's say you put a hundred bucks in your checking account or your savings, right? The bank will take 90% of that and go loan that out to somebody else. Correct. So they keep $10. They're required by law to keep at least 10%. They keep $10 on hand for you to come and grab that money out of the bank. Yep. If you wanted to go get your, and obviously these are smaller numbers, but I'm doing this on a larger scale for everybody. If you wanted to go get $90 out, out of your bank, they would have to lend you somebody else's money yep. to pull out because they took 90 bucks and gave it to somebody else. It's just like that one source, uh, South Park episode where they get, he gives money to the bank and, and it's gone. Yeah. <laughs> 100%. So when you see those digits in your checking account or whatever, right? They're not there, dude. They're, they're gone. They, they've been lent out, right? Who gave the, the bank the ability to lend out the money or, or give the money in the first place? The Federal Reserve. They created it, they printed it, or they entered digits on an account and sent it over to the bank to lend out, and the world goes around and around and around. So there's nothing backing those dollars anymore. We're not on the gold standard where the U.S. government treasury could only print or give out enough money that was backed by gold. And so now we live in an economy and we live in a financial landscape that is all based on faith. It's all based on you believing that the Federal Reserve is going to be there for you in a time where like a bank falls apart. And so that's why they created the FDIC to ensure you that if and when a situation like this happens, you're protected by the U.S. government and they will print money or do whatever they need to to make sure that all those people get their money back up to $250,000 in a checking. Yep, and that's why everybody right now is on the <laughs> TikTok and Instagram Reels and Facebook saying, hey, make sure your phones are FDIC insured yeah. because of this major bank collapse and now everybody's freaking out that you know now I don't have access to my phones. And so let me go a little step further with the whole FDIC thing. And what I was told when looking into this, and this was from years and years and years ago, because I had a worry that I had more than the 250000 in a bank account, and I didn't want to say, should, should I split these up, right? Because if it's only insured up to two fifty, and I've got five hundred, where does the rest go? It just goes away. And so what I was told from a person that was very high up in Santander is that if you read the fine print of the FDIC, the way that they pay you back can be in a lot of different ways. And it's actually over like a 30 year period. So they tout this FDIC thing. You're protected. You're great. You're, um, a lot of it is BS. Um, you might see part of that money. You might see a hundred grand and the rest, the rest of the 150, they pay you over 30 years. 
or they give you a stock dividend, or they decide how they're going to repay you your monetary value back. Well, do I get my seven or eight percent interest that they get for me when they buy a house? Or <laughs> no. <laughs> so yeah. So this again goes back to the whole idea that, dude, the monetary system is all made up. It's completely fabricated. It's completely made up. It's a fagazi or whatever they say in Wolf of Wall Street. Yep. It's made up, dude. It's digits on a bank. It actually holds absolutely no value. The only value it, it, it holds is that we all believe and trust in it. And the second that something like this happens, um, the population says they worry. They freak out. And they start st stashing cash in their list. 100%. And so what does this do? This, this actually is the reverse of what's been happening in the marketplace where there's inflation and uh, people are struggling with monetary value, what happens in a time where people are freaking out is that they have to actually lower interest rates because- it, They need more people borrowing. Correct. More people in the market. They, they need people to come out of the shelter, right? And so they're gonna make it more attractive for people to buy homes. They're gonna make it more attractive to, to loan money out. They're going to stop doing what they have been doing by increasing rates. If they continue to increase the rates while people are running for the hills, it's going to create a very, very, very deep, deep recession yep. um, where nobody's going to be doing anything, right? So what does that mean for inflation, Josh? I mean, right now, the reason why they've been increasing rates and everything like that is to try and battle this inflation that we've been seeing. Mm -hmm. And in my personal market here, our market in the Lancaster County area, Inventory on houses specifically yep. have been next to none, right? Yeah. I mean, we can't find a house that's been sitting on the market for more than 30 days unless it's very run down in a not a uh, desirable location. Yep. So now that inventory is still so low uh -huh. and now rates are coming back down. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, so ever since uh, this happened, um, interest rates have actually on a mortgage have fallen almost 100 basis points, like almost like overnight. Um, so it's already affected the mortgage industry as far as interest rates go. It'll be hard to say what happens long term, and that's uh, really going to be dependent on how the Fed reacts of what they do next, right? Um, but what I will tell you is, in an environment, and you know that this is why Biden got up and they're having all these news anchors on, and everybody's talking about. If you look at, at media now, the media machine, everybody's saying. You're fine. You're protected. Don't worry about it. You know, it's, 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 we're going to have more regulation now for banks and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And while that's all true and dandy, because you don't need to worry about it because the people that are telling you this make up the entire system anyway, what they're doing is trying to not create a mass hysteria, right? Because if that happens, it's going to lead to a Great Depression. It's going to lead to people not trusting the U.S. government not trusting the monetary system as a whole. And so that creates complete chaos, and they can't have that, right? Um, so that's that's kind of where something like this, where a bank, a, a major bank goes under and it's public news, um, it, it creates a new conversation, right? And, and so we all know how the monetary value system works like underneath of it, right? Like that the stuff that we have is just, well, it's actually cotton. It's not paper. It's cotton based, but we know it's fake, right? We, we know it's made up, but something like this put, pushes it out to the mainstream media um, and pushes it out to a lot of people that probably, you know, majority of, of Americans don't have a ton of cash, right? Um, so what I would tell you is going back to the whole monetary system and value, there's, there's things or assets in our world and our environment that are a lot more uh, beneficial that have more monetary value than cash sitting in a bank account, like a lot more, like a piece of real estate, for instance, something hard, you know, concrete asset that it doesn't matter if a bank in, you know, California goes under, it's, it's there, right? And it's insured and, you know, it, it's a hard asset. And right away, when you say that, people are going to say, well, what, what, what about back in 08? What happened back in 08? Well, yeah. Then there was a lot of adjustable rate mortgages. So, you know, people were buying in the hopes that property value was going to continue to increase. And at the time, they were cash flowing. And once the rate caught up to them, then they weren't cash flowing anymore. And then that's where the foreclosures came about. 
Yeah. Well, and so what happened back in two eight in two thousand eight was, I w- I I would reluctantly say similar, but it was similar to um, the whole banking system it, it um, in general. But in two thousand eight, there was a lot of loan officers, and there was ver- there was Dodd Frank didn't didn't exist. There were no controls over what these banks and lenders and and mortgage brokers were able or willing to do. So like a lot of uh, LOs were making six, seven, 10% commission, which again, honestly, the commission thing's really not the issue. What happened was there was no practices as far as who could get approved for mortgage. It was very, very, very easy to get approved for a mortgage. And so the guidelines were basically, if you had a pulse, you were approved. And so they were creating all these loans for people that really could not afford them. And then they would actually, bu- the big banks would bundle these loans up into mortgage-backed securities and sell them on the open market. Well, they sold so many of these horrible loans that were getting grade A ratings that it was inevitable it was going to collapse, right? And so what happened after that? The same thing that's probably going to happen now, which the government came in created a bunch of acts, they created Dodd-Frank and a bunch of other ones and rules and regs for the mortgage industry to tell tell them what they can and cannot do. And so the guidelines got a lot tougher. Um, you actually had to get people's tax returns and they actually had to prove to you that they had the income that they stated that they had. Wow, that's crazy. It's crazy to think that the, the industry even operated the way it did back then, but it was the Wild West. You could literally go to a bank and say, I make a hundred grand. And they would say, okay, we believe you. That's literally how it was. And so um, the same thing will happen now is that the banking industry is going to change again, right? There's going to be rules and regs as far as um, depository amounts that you have to have on hand, maybe a certain amount of um, actual clients that you can have versus, you know, instead of the 10% thing, right? And so... It's going to, it's going, something will happen that it will be more regulated moving forward. Very familiar. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And I mean, I think it also, like I was saying about the adjustable rates, I mean, now with that, a lot of people are getting fixed rate stuff. So yeah. now you're not getting any fluctuation in terms of. But I want to be careful with that because adjustable rate mortgages get, have a horrible uh, name for them, but it actually has nothing to do with what happened in 2008. And adjustable rate mortgages can actually make sense for a lot of people. And people don't realize that. And it's still it's still taboo in the industry. But an adjustable rate mortgage cannot adjust over a certain amount. So what people think is they think that an adjustable rate mortgage means it's at the um it's at the whims of what mortgage rates are currently, right? And so if mortgage rates go to twenty percent, now my rate is gonna be twenty. That's not how this works. Adjustable rate mortgages stay the same for a certain period. And then they adjust as the market, you know, differs, but there's a cap. Okay. So it can't go above a certain level. There's limits to them. So it's not like how it was back in 2008 where it's open-ended and you're right, your rate might go, your, your mortgage payment might go from 1200 to 2400 It can never go above 1700 Yeah. And so it's important to realize. And so why is this beneficial for some people? Well, let's say that you want a lower monthly now because you're a college grad getting your doctorate. And so you don't have a lot of disposable income because you got a lot of student debts, but you're in, you know, medical school and you would like to purchase a home and you know that you're going to have a solid income in it in two or three years from now. Well, an adjustable rate could be the perfect vehicle for you because you can get in at a lower rate now in a lower monthly and what you would be able to own a fixed rate correct and so you now you can afford a lot more and you know you're going to be graduating from med school and you're going to have the income and it's okay if the basis points go up 0.5 percent right 50 50 50 basis points or whatever later down the road um so it's all determined on your unique uh position in life where you're at it's completely different for everybody else um, and so that's just a little bit on, on adjustable rates because they actually can come in handy for, for certain people. And it, they're not as crazy as, uh, what the marketplace thinks that they are. Cause times have changed. Exactly. Yeah. 
they had to. And <laughs> what I was referring to that back in 08 was the, you know, going from a 1200 to a 2400 a month payment. I mean, that was happening. It was the wild west, man. Like, yeah. like, like literally I, I heard stories of, um, people putting their dog's name down on applications and falsifying oh socials and it's then getting approved. Crazy. Like it, it literally happened. It, it did. Wow. That's insane. Um, it's like, honestly, it's like buying a car from Carvana. Like you can go to Carvana and maybe I shouldn't blow them up on this, but it, they probably will blow up because you can go uh, and I purchased, you know, not that I'm saying that I don't make the amount of money I, I, I make, but I put in a number of what I make and they say, okay, this is how much you're approved for. And then I buy the car and nobody, nobody looks to see if my tax returns match. If I have my K ones, they don't car. ask. That's all car dealerships. Dude, that's ridiculous. It's I just, I just bought two separate vehicles. It's ridiculous. Dude. Like, don't buy cars unless you have to. They're awful. Yeah. Messy. No, they're a liability, but, but I, I had to, you know, for uh, vehicle pur purposes, I needed to be able to get from A to B, so did my lady. And dude, both times, I just wrote down, they check your credit. They do run credit, but other than running credit, you can write down however much money. And I'm not I mean, even, again, I wrote down the amount of money I do make, but they were like, hey, you're good. I'm not even sure if Carvana checks credit, honestly. I mean, I, I know they do like probably a soft pull, yeah. but like they don't like actually like look at like your credit history. I'm, well, I'm sure they do, but it's, it's I think it's more like a soft pull. Um, but it, dude, it's, it's wild. Like that, you kind of have to check, you know, <laughs> to see if the, the information that people are giving you are valid, right? Yeah. Well, it's a little bit different, a repo versus an eviction. Now it affects you personally the same in terms of credit, maybe not quite as drastically. I'm sure, uh, you know, they're both on your credit, but I mean, if uh, it's, it's pretty bad. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's pretty bad. A car that was to evict somebody. Well, and that's how they look at it. Well, that's how they look at it is yeah. the, the risk to it is, is, a lot less it's minimal um and it's a lot easier to do for them so they don't yeah. worry about it because all they really care about uh, quite honestly is the sale they don't really care about the long-term interest on the payment there they make money by moving inventory the more inventory they move the more money they make yep you're talking about the dealership cars yeah. correct yeah. correct yeah because the bank is the one holding 100 percent. yeah Again, the bank will come take your vehicle from you. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Yep. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, no, it's it's kind of crazy the world that we live in as far as like finances go. And there's a lot of um there's a there's a lot of studies that have been done by very smart people um that don't necessarily say that the way that we have it set up is the best way. Um and it'll be interesting to see how it changes in America over you know hundreds of years because it's almost like a big ponzi scheme and it's almost like they, they, ponzi scheme. well that's and it's becoming more and more to light and fruition correct our access to things like youtube and everybody that is educated on it is now putting out that information and more and more folks are getting educated on it and it, i mean this is something i didn't know about five years ago you know i was a young 22 year old kid that didn't care about I, i'll just worry about hanging out with my friends and having a good time and that's and that's how majority of people are. And that's why it doesn't, you know, always come to light and it doesn't always get, get talked about until something like this happens. And that it's, you know, and I'm not trying to say that the government is like trying to hold us down and like, it's, it's a horrible system and blah, 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 but times change and the needs of a society change over time because of what the world does right how everything changes and so if you have a monetary system that's backed by nothing but good faith and the faith of that gets shaken bad things can happen right you can fall into a a bad way of being people can ultimately rebel against that society they could you know and what happens if it gets to the point where the dollar has no faith anymore. Like it already has gone down in value significantly. And that's why, you know, not that it's in any good shape right now, but I mean, that's why a lot of people are attracted to crypto um, mm -hmm. because it's decentralized and, you know, it it's not regulated as much, which is why a lot of people frown upon it. But that's why a lot of people who are educated in the fractional reserve banking system are thinking, hey, well, I'll put my money here. Yeah. And it might be a better option. Yeah, and that's why, quite honestly, I mean, to get things done in this world, it's important to remember what all your resources are. 
and not to be so heavily dependent on cash. Yeah, I mean, obviously money makes the world go round. Um, but if you look at and take stock of all the resources you have, I would argue that money is not the most important one. Um, you can do a lot without cash. Uh, and typically the people that have the most cash are, are the most resourceful, meaning they take stock and are able to use their other resources that brings them cash. Right. Well, and that's the whole, especially in real estate, the whole mantra of OPM, you know, yes. leveraging other people's money, because at the end of the day, as long as good, if it's good debt, you're in good shape. Yeah. And, well, and this goes back to the same thing that the government does. If people have faith in you, they yeah. will give you their resources. They will give you money. They will give you time. They will give you energy. It all comes down to faith, right? In the same way that the government operates. Is the same way that every person on the planet operates, whether you realize it or not. The more responsibilities you have, the better you bear those responsibilities, the more people have faith and trust in you, which creates more resources for you that benefit those people that give their faith, time, and resources to you, which then snowballs into even more responsibilities and the next level, right? And so this is, this is the compound effect of discipline and showing up every day and operating regardless of how you feel about it it's it's all integrated right it it creates not only faith for other people but for yourself the more you show up and do the things that you said you were going to do the more you believe in you which then creates a compound effect into the next level right yep. it's it's all the same thing man it's 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 all integrated it's all the same thing um and so you know luckily we have a uh, a government that has been around for a long time and a lot of people have a lot of faith in the government and they should right because it's worked out so far um i think the, i think the only reverse of that or the only problem with that is worrying or giving too much faith to the point where um you're so dependent on somebody else like the government to make every decision for you that you're incapable then of making your own decisions or doing anything for yourself and that's a fine line, right? It's a fine line between tyranny and supporting, you know, uh, a body that is trying to look out for the people. Yes. And that's, you know, th these are all things that um, come to question and are, are materialized in the world when something like a big bank falls apart. Yep. Yeah, and then you have the whole um, governmental side of things that's, you know, that's why some people are far right and some people are far left because of the certain beliefs in it. Socialism, communism. It's almost 50% actually. Yeah. And it always has been since the beginning of time, which I find very interesting that it's always almost 50% divided. It's, that's, I, there's something about that that I, I haven't been able to grasp, but that's, that's a meaningful thing. It's, it's kind of mind boggling, but I think a lot of that has to, has to do with human emotion and how, how it comes down. Like you even look like a football team, right? 50 50 right? And, and right way uh right brain left brain you know absolutely yeah yeah so i think that probably has something to do with it but it's funny because like people always need an adverse opposing side everything in life is the i always love the the yin and uh yin yin and la, yin and yang i was gonna say yin and lang i always love yin and lang i can't still can't say it yin and yang, yin and yang. the yin and yang right because you have chaos and order black and white, and then you have bits, your dots of each. They're opposing, yep. but then they bleed into each other. That's how everything in life is too, man. It's, a, it's awesome. You need, you need that opposing force. That's why my wife and I get along so well and sometimes don't get along so well is because she's completely different than me and I'm completely different than her. Yep. And the only way we work is if she, I allow her to bleed into me and she allows me to bleed into her sometimes, right? We, we need to, we need to have that, that force, that pushing force against yourself. And then you at times need to understand when there could be a benefit to listening to what the other person has to say. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's a give and take, right? Yeah. If, if you marry somebody who's very similar to you, then neither party has anything to give to each other. Yeah. They're, they're just a, the same thing. Right. Exactly. Um, that, that doesn't help. Um, so yeah. But uh, so that's kind of a little bit about, well, a little bit about a lot. 
but I think it was it was a good episode. And uh, yeah, anything else you wanna? No, not right now. I think cool. I'm I'm good. Well, if you got value out of today's video, um, and even if you didn't, I want to hear about it. We want to hear about it. So comment down below. We can start a conversation. Um, there was somebody who posted. So I think there was like three or four people on a, on a recent short that was posted. That was like. A bunch of like this is completely wrong this is horrible advice terrible i liked every one of them and then one of the first commenters said wow three people told you you were wrong and you don't even respond and so i responded and said hey you're entitled to your opinion everybody is i appreciate that you're commenting so please i completely okay with anybody who has adverse uh opinions, commenting, and I just want to start a dialogue, start a conversation, and I appreciate you watching. So even if you like our stuff, even if you don't like it, follow us, subscribe, and we can make the world a better place by having the differences of opinions talked about. Definitely. Is that yin and yang? Yin and yang! Perfect. That's a good place to leave it. Thanks, everybody, for watching. See you guys.